Today I want to talk a little bit about um, what's been going on in this country. And to do that, we have to kind of go back in history a little bit. So, e pluribus unum was the motto proposed for the first great seal of the United States by John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson in 1776. It was during the same year as the Declaration of Independence was signed. It's a Latin phrase that means out of many, one. The phrase offered a strong statement of the American determination to form a single nation from a collection of states. In these last years, and especially these last months, we have been reminded of the challenges of realizing the ideal of unity in a country of people from different backgrounds and beliefs. But e plumeris unum expresses more than an ideal. It reflects an essential truth about human society, that we are stronger and more resilient together, embracing all of our diversity than we are apart the interdependency of all reality. In Buddhism, we express this by cultivating equanimity, the wish for all beings to be free from bias, attachment, and anger. When cultivating compassion and love and altruism, everything works better. Two days ago, when ex-officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murdering George Floyd, we witnessed a coming together of people against injustice. Historically, there has not been much comfort in situations like the George Floyd trial. So I came across an interview with Philip uh, Atiba Goff, who is a professor of African American Studies and Psychology at Yale. He's also the co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity. And his words were very um, impactful to me. Hearing a person who lives the uh, injustice that we read about is very helpful. He spoke about this uh, the day before the verdict was handed out, so before we knew. We've had trials of other folks who have been obviously guilty of savage acts before and the country and world watch to see what would happen. I don't know if there's an inflection point unless we choose differently. There's so much going on. There's the fall of the U.S. stature on the international stage. There's our infrastructure crumbling around us. There's our Justice Department that needs to be put back together. But what strikes me about all of that happening around this trial, the reason why there is a shadow looming over all of it, because every piece that is broken that needs to be made whole, it was once okay. It was once something that was really good about this country, that people who lived here could be proud of and was the envy of the entire world. But not racism. We've never gotten that right. We've never had a criminal legal system that treated everybody equally. So if we've got an obligation to one another, all of us, maybe we can do that on our roads and bridges and maybe in the Justice Department in our foreign policy. But the one thing we can't have in a historical context is a time we ever got racism right. Part of the reason it feels different now is that we're hoping that this time is different. We are sitting here waiting for the verdict. I just want to clarify, I understand that the charge here is murder, but what we witnessed was a lynching. That's part of the reason why it's important to put it in the historical context. It was a public message to people that what Officer Chauvin was doing was okay and you might be next. Part of why we are sitting here is because of the absurdity that there is any suspense about the outcome of this trial at all. We all watched what happened to George Floyd. The other part is there's no way to actually get justice for George Floyd. He's not going to come back alive. There is no way to get remedy for the children who had to take the stand and say, yes, 
in my formative years, this is what I saw, and I knew it was wrong, and the person who had authority to take away life and liberty could not get up off a man's neck. There will be no remedy through this court process for anybody. There might be a measure of accountability and the fact that we could feel like something new is an in indictment. It's just an indictment for a case we haven't yet really put on trial. And the hope is on the other side of something like sense in this particular court case that we'll do something different for the first time on racism and punishment in this country for the first time. I can't overstate it. Because in all of our history, we're looking for the example that makes this right. The place we can get back to, and there is no going backwards to find comfort. The only possible comfort is what we choose to do next. I found these words so powerful and could feel the weight of history we all carry today. Thankfully, something different was done this time in this court case. So how did we come to this inequality and how to get, how do we get out from under it? I read a recent interview with Brian Stevenson. He's a lawyer and founder and executive director of Equal Justice Initiative, it's which advocates for death row inmates and fair uh, criminal justice system. Uh, he wrote the book Just, Just Mercy, and there was a film based on this memoir that was released in 2019. He lives in Montgomery, Alabama. I found what he said very helpful in understanding a piece of the path out of this inequality. He was asked by an interviewer, for years you've been talking about a need for a ra racial reckoning in America. What form should that take? This is what he says. Well, I think we have done a very poor job in this country in understanding our history, and I think what we're first going to have to do is engage in an era of truth-telling about who we are and the multiple ways in which we have failed to confront and overcome racial injustice and racial inequality. We've just lied to ourselves about our history. We never acknowledge that we are a post-genocide society that what Europeans did to indigenous people when they came to this continent was genocide. We killed millions of native people through famine and war and disease. We took their land. We made the people leave. There's no framework in which that is just or fair. And instead of grappling with the unfairness of that history and reckoning with it, we created a narrative of racial difference to justify it. We said that indigenous people are different, native people are savages. And we use this kind of rhetoric to justify the abuse and mistreatment of that population. And then we created a constitution that talked about equality and justice for all and didn't apply those values to indigenous people because we have shielded them from fair and just treatment through this narrative of racial difference. That's the same narrative we relied on to justify slavery. And we haven't been truthful about the legacy of slavery. And I've argued that the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude and forced labor. I think it was the idea we created in this country that black people are not as good as white people, that black people are not fully human. Black people are less evolved, less capable, less worthy, less deserving. And that ideology of white supremacy, that narrative of racial difference, was the real evil of American slavery. I think this reckoning with the truth, truth-telling, is urgently needed in this country, along the lines of what you see in South Africa. When you go there, you are reminded of all the pain and horror of the apartheid. There's an apartheid museum. There are spaces that compel that reflection. I talk a lot about Germany because I think you can't go to Germany without having some reckoning with the Holocaust. There are stones and symbols and memorials and monuments everywhere. 
And that's a country that has realized that its ability to move forward required it to reckon with the past. There are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany because there has been truth telling about the Holocaust. It would be unconscionable there to honor the architects and defenders of the Third Reich, the perpetrators of the Holocaust. But I live in a re region of the country in the United States where the landscape is littered with iconography of the Confederacy. In my state of Alabama, Jefferson Davis's birthday is a state holiday. Confederate Memorial Day is a state holiday. We don't have Martin Luther King Day. We have Martin Luther King slash Robert E. Lee Day. Streets and monuments honor the architects and defenders of slavery, the perpetrators of racial hierarchy and white supremacy. And I just think in an absence of reckoning and truth telling, these patterns and habits will continue to undermine fairness and equality. Now, as a Buddhist, I have direct knowledge of how powerful visual images and symbols are to the mind. They transform our minds without a doubt. Thankfully, there recently has been some movement to replace these white supremacist symbols, such as statues. Some have been removed. Also in the advertising world, some of the caricatures depicting black people have been removed. Also, some of the curriculum in schools has been rewritten to reflect what actually happened to indigenous people of this country, as well as what actually happened to slaves. We have an attorney general who recently said, we have to protect each other. We have to make sure that we all are protected. When he said that, he teared up. And this has to do with how his family came to this country to be protected. And this was articulated by the nation's chief law enforcement officer, Merrick Garland. This is good news. Yesterday, Al Sharpton, Reverend Al Sharpton, said that he feels that the momentum is very strong now. Last August, Martin Luther King III and Reverend Al Sharpton, Sharpton held a rally around the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the middle of uh, the pandemic in Washington. 200,000 people came. He said a third of them were white. It was a crowd of intergenerational and interracial people all coming together. He compared the crowd to the one in the 60s that he was in that got the Voting Act passed. So there is momentum now to do something different. So what can I do? What can you do? Well, we can develop our equanimity. We can train ourselves to quit looking for the differences in each other. We can look for the commonalities in all people, regardless of their beliefs, how they look, how they worship, E plumeris unum, out of many one. <laughs>